Hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload. Uh, here we are getting close to Christmas. Thankfully, with a Midoki El Nino, right now we're still getting somewhat mild temperatures for this time of year. Uh, I, I know of some years it's been even worse. And I bring up the weather because of preconceived notions that we have about history. And that is how dark the Dark Ages really were. I mean, if you, if you read some of the textbooks in uh, high schools and middle schools today, it sounds like the Dark Ages were just snow-covered and frigid and the cold Siberia going all throughout Europe. Well, our Prager University segment for today shows that that was not the case. Let's take a look and see how dark the Dark Ages actually were. No period of history is more misunderstood or underappreciated than the Middle Ages. The 10 centuries from the fall of the Roman Empire in the 5th century to the start of the Renaissance in the 15th. This is especially true between the year 1000 when global warming brought grapes to England and grain to the coasts of Greenland, doubling the population and reviving town life all across Europe, and 1348 after the warming had ended and the Black Death arrived from the east. Let's take a closer look at these years. We'll make a good start by dispelling some nonsense. The people of the Middle Ages did not believe the earth was flat. They knew it was round. The ancients said it was round. The fathers of the church said it was round. They saw its shadow during an eclipse of the moon and the shadow was round. They saw masks of ships sinking below the horizon round. More nonsense. The Middle Ages were cheerless. Quite the reverse. They were full of color, of celebrations involving everybody in town. They invented the carnival. They revived popular drama which had lain dormant for a thousand years. Whatever they did, whether it was sinning or fighting or repenting or falling in love or traveling thousands of miles to Rome or to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, they did it with energy and gusto. What do we owe to the Middle Ages? How about the university? Medieval man invented it. For the first time in the history of the world, you could go to Paris or Bologna or Padua or Oxford or Prague or Cologne and study under masters of law, medicine, philosophy, and theology, and your degree designating you as a master or a doctor would hold good anywhere in Europe. It was an international community of scholars. A young Thomas Aquinas, born in southern Italy at the beginning of the 13th century, would travel to Cologne to study philosophy under the philosopher biologist Albert the Great, then to Paris, where he taught theology and philosophy, then to Rome and back to France. And this sort of thing was the rule among scholars not the exception. How about modern science? Thomas's teacher, Albert, was a biologist. Why should that surprise us? Medieval man believed that God made the world as an ordered whole. They learned it both from scripture and from pagan thinkers such as Aristotle. Science did not burst on the scene with Galileo. Copernicus died in the 16th century, but he was a priest astronomer at a Polish university founded in the Middle Ages. He wasn't even the first man to suggest that the Earth orbited the Sun. Others had ventured the suggestion. Most prominent was the late medieval Nicholas of Cusa, a philosopher and a cardinal in the church. How about architecture? If the Middle Ages were dark and ignorant, how come ordinary people, masons, Carpenters, painters, sculptors, glazers erected the most beautiful and majestic buildings to grace the earth, the Gothic cathedrals, without power tools, with pulleys and winches and scaffolding in their bare hands, they built up lacework in stone and glass, flooding vast interior spaces with color and light. We have nothing to match their complexity and beauty. And art? Studying the ancients, medieval man produced whole genres of art that the world had never seen. 
There had never been anything like Dante's Divine Comedy, or Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, or the Arthurian legends of Chrétien de Troyes, or the paintings of Giotto, or the astonishingly beautiful and precise work of the illuminators of manuscripts. What else do we owe to them? Western music. They invented our musical notation and Western harmony, not to mention the humble carols we enjoy at Christmas time. A tradition of local self-government. Witness the chartered towns all over Europe, free associations of men united for the common good, friars, guildsmen, members of lay orders devoted to good works, people who established schools, orphanages, and hospitals. Far from the Dark Ages, which it is popularly called, the Middle Ages might better be described as the Brilliant Ages, a startling epoch of progress from science to art, from philosophy to medicine. Indeed, in one crucial way, we are less civilized than those who enhanced human existence over a thousand years ago. We dismiss the achievements of our ancestors and fall short of them. They honored their ancestors and surpassed them. I'm Anthony Esselin of Providence College for Prager University. Now keep that in the back of your mind when you look at what is going on in Europe today. And I'm not talking about Brexit, even though Brexit does have something to do with it. I'm talking about the Yellow Vest protests going on in France. And there are specific reasons why those protests are currently going on. And we're going to actually cover that today. There is a parallel in history that the French people are going through. We're going to address that in the second half of the program. So today, it's all about France. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a bottle of French wine handy as we go through this episode. Um, but if you've got one at home, you might want to just crack it out because today is uh, French Day. Even though we're in December, we should be talking about Christmas. Uh, the issues of the day really show that we need to really cover this. You don't see this much on your mainstream media, television shows. This is something that they conveniently ignore because it does not fit their political narrative. And yes, if you watch, you know, some of the major news networks, if they try to cover, as they try to cover this, it may actually even drive you to drink. Uh, so here's what we're going to do is show you right now a timeline of these yellow vest protests. And then we'll get a little bit more into what they're about and the response and, and where we're at today. So let's take a look at the timeline. The rare chaos across France. The worst riots Paris has seen in decades started with an online petition posted back in May. People angered by government plans to raise fuel taxes to fight pollution called to lower prices instead. The petition eventually drew hundreds of thousands of supporters, snowballing into a full-fledged protest movement against government policies. Its members call themselves the Yellow Vests, referring to safety vests mandatory in all French cars. A date was set for a first street protest, November 17th. That day, some 300,000 people across the country turned out to man roadblocks. Sporadic demonstrations continued, leading up to another big rally on Saturday, November 24th. But protests turned violent when thousands left their approved demonstration point to vandalize shops on the Champs Elysees and burn cars. The extent of the discontent caught the government off guard, and chaos worsened the following weekend. For the first time since the 1968 student protests, hundreds set cars and buildings on fire, hurling rocks at police, looting businesses. The nation discovered on television the iconic Arc de Triomphe covered with insulting graffiti calling for President Emmanuel Macron's resignation. Up until that point, the government had refused to budge on its tax plans. And for a short while, President Macron, away in Argentina, tried to keep that line. I will always respect protests. But I will never accept violence. 
Once back in Paris, President Macron gathered key ministers, fearing upcoming protests could get out of control. He was booed when visiting targeted sites, like outside burned down police headquarters in central France. Then, the government took a first step back, suspending the tax hike for six months. That announcement angered protesters even more. And as several sectors, farmers, truck drivers and students threatened to join the movement, the government scrapped the tax hike entirely for 2019. But many say authorities reacted too late. The protest has now widened beyond demands over fuel and has turned into widespread anger against policies many believe favor the rich. Gilets jaunes, or yellow vests, refers to the neon vests that all French drivers must keep in their vehicles for breakdown emergencies. But now it's come to symbolize a protest movement, frustrated with French President Emmanuel Macron, who they say is disconnected from the day-to-day -day economic difficulties suffered by workers and retirees like Robert Tichy. There are a lot of taxes in this country, a lot of taxes. Euh, on est dirigé par euh, quasiment, j'appellerai aujourd'hui euh, de la vermine qui nous dirige. C'est malheureux. The gilets jaunes represent the most serious threat yet to Macron's agenda and his presidency. The movement started off in response to Macron's proposal to raise the fuel tax, but now its target is much broader. Protesters are seeking to reverse Macron's repeal of much of the wealth tax, and many want the president to resign. The grassroots Gilets Jaunes protest movement surfaced in October 2018, following President Macron's proposal to raise fuel taxes to reduce pollution. It began in rural communities, where people depend on cars to make a living, such as Surcon, a private hire driver. It's an impact that now the price of gas has increased. It's not rentable for us. That's the gros problem. Thank you, Monsieur. Thank you very much. The Gilets Jaunes movement is strongest in small cities and towns outside of France's big metropolitan areas. Wages there tend to be low, and French taxes are high. In fact, the OECD recently said that France is the most tax economy out of all of its member countries. By mid-November, more than a quarter of a million people took part in Gilets Jaunes protests, and in Paris in December, such events had descended into rioting. The movement, which mobilizes through social media platforms, has largely rebuffed the government's appeals to negotiate, discouraging representatives from sitting down with officials. Its appeal has now broadened too, becoming a rallying cry against the government and what protesters call a president of the rich. Paris residents like Rabbi Mondes say people have had enough. Tous les politiques qui touchent des sommes importantes, mais pour le peuple, il reste que des miettes. The Gilets jaunes call President Macron president of the rich for a number of reasons. But the most important is his decision to repeal much of France's wealth tax. It doesn't help that Macron, a former investment banker, is himself a wealthy man. The Gilets jaunes have already succeeded to some extent after President Macron delayed his proposed fuel tax hike. And while some protesters, such as Laura Cordonnier, are optimistic, On espère que ça va faire bouger les choses. On espère. others, like Benjamin Vrigno, take a different view about rising costs. Ah bah, de toute façon, ça va déclencher une guerre civile. Hein. Et moi, comme tous les, la plupart des citoyens qui sont là, je pense qu'on est tous prêts. Hein. Okay, so now that you have an understanding of what is going on in France. A couple of things I want to point out before we get into Macron's response. I'm trying to sound French here. It's not working, but um, just from the last, well, we actually played two videos. Uh, we play, decided to play them back to back. Uh, wages are too low. Taxes are too high. The people had enough. The government gives them crumbs. Crumbs. Where did we hear that before? Speaker of the House of Representatives elect Nancy Pelosi over the tax cut that was passed a year ago. That thousand dollars that's given back to people, well, that's just crumbs. That's what Nancy Pelosi said. We actually covered it on the show before. People have had enough. 
And here's the other thing that these protests uh, you know, were, were part of. And it, it was a backlash, and it was mentioned right away, a backlash against the fuel tax. Why is the fuel tax being raised in France? To fight global warming or climate change and, you know, on the eve of the Paris uh, Climate Accord. People are seeing in the middle class, they're getting squeezed. They're getting squeezed over all of these left-wing initiatives that succeed in redistributing the wealth they take from you and give to somebody else. In the case of the French, they take from the people and line their own pockets. That's what's happening. The people in France have had enough. Hmm, fuel tax. Governor-elect Walls, here in Minnesota, right after he got elected, was walking up the steps of the state capitol building. And he announces that he is in favor of raising the fuel tax in Minnesota. We're already one of the highest tax states in the country. Our wages are low. People are living on crumbs. I'm wondering when France, what's going on in France is going to happen in Minnesota. The climate is start, and I'm not talking the, the weather climate, but the political climate is starting to take shape. Now, we haven't gotten to the point where people feel that they've had enough. They, haven't, you know, they don't feel like the throat, the, the, the government boot is at the throat. And there's one big difference between us and France. We are a state inside a larger country. Whereas if people have had enough, they can always move to a better st a state that suits them better. Uh, I just found out today that a longtime friend of mine has made the decision that he is going to be moving. And I think he may be taking off tomorrow. So that migration of people out of Minnesota has already happened. We are going to lose a congressional seat in uh, the, the next uh, redistricting effective in 2022. That's almost a foregone conclusion. Minnesota barely escaped with the eight seats intact uh, from 2012. <clears throat> so what we're seeing in France is that wages are low, taxes are high, the people have had enough, and the government is giving them crumbs. And they are protesting. Now, the last time that I've seen protests in France, it was always about the migration, and it was the, uh, the French people and the French, um, well, not so much the French people, it was the French uh, military police force going against the uh, Muslims who were brought in and were rioting. Those are the last, I actually, I actually tuned into this a little bit late because I thought it was just more of the same what we were seeing in France and Britain just a couple of years ago. But no, this is an uprising by the people, the people who have had enough. So now, what does the French president have to say uh, when he addressed the nation? Well, I'm going to tell you before we play this, here's what he tried to do. Pacify them with more promises of government spending. Macron sounds like a Democrat, doesn't he? Oh, well, the people are rebelling, so we'll just give them more taxpayer money. That's the Democrat answer. We're going to throw money at the problem. That doesn't necessarily mean the problem is going to be solved. It just means you know, peaceful enough for me to be able to do what I'm, I'm going to do and stay in power. That's the Democrat way, it seems. So let's take a look at Emmanuel Macron's address. Française, Français. Nous voilà ensemble au rendez-vous de notre pays et de notre avenir. Les événements de ces dernières semaines dans l'Hexagone et Outre-mer ont profondément troublé la nation. Ils ont mêlé des revendications légitimes et un enchaînement de violences inadmissibles. Et je veux vous le dire d'emblée, ces violences ne bénéficieront d'aucune indulgence. Nous avons tous vu le jeu des opportunistes qui ont essayé de profiter des colères sincères pour les dévoyer. Nous avons tous vu les irresponsables politiques dont le seul projet était de bousculer la République, cherchant le désordre et l'anarchie. Aucune colère 
ne justifie qu'on s'attaque à un policier, à un gendarme, qu'on dégrade un commerce ou des bâtiments publics. Notre liberté n'existe que parce que chacun peut exprimer ses opinions, que d'autres peuvent ne pas les partager, sans que personne n'ait à avoir peur de ces désaccords. Quand la violence se déchaîne, la liberté cesse. Le pays traverse ce mal-vivre qui est le nôtre. Mais je crois profond. Je demande au gouvernement et au Parlement de faire le nécessaire afin qu'on puisse vivre mieux de son travail dès le début d'année prochaine. Le salaire d'un travailleur au SMIC augmentera de 100 euros par mois dès 2019, sans qu'il en coûte un euro de plus pour l'employeur. Je veux renouer avec une idée juste, que le surcroît de travail accepté constitue un surcroît de revenus. Les heures supplémentaires seront versées sans impôt ni charge dès 2019. Et je veux qu'une vraie amélioration soit tout de suite perceptible. C'est pourquoi je demanderai à tous les employeurs qui le peuvent de verser une prime de fin d'année à leurs employés. Et cette prime n'aura à acquitter ni impôt ni charge. Les retraités constituent une partie précieuse de notre nation. Pour ceux qui touchent moins de 2000 euros par mois, nous annulerons en 2019 la hausse de CSG subie cette année. Dès demain, le Premier ministre présentera l'ensemble de ses... Nous sommes à un moment historique pour notre pays. Par le dialogue, le respect, l'engagement, nous réussirons. Nous sommes à la tâche et je reviendrai m'exprimer devant vous pour vous rendre compte. Mon seul souci, c'est vous. Mon seul combat, c'est pour vous. Notre seule bataille, c'est pour la France. Dialogue, respect and commitment. Dialogue, respect and commitment. What does that sound like? Oh, that sounds like every time a Democrat, and when I say Democrat, hear me out here, I'm not talking about your average Democrat voter. I'm talking about the Democrat, far left, progressive people in power. The Nancy Pelosi's, the Chuck Schumer's, uh, the people who are celebrities who want to use their platform in order to get their left-wing message out to the masses. These are the people I'm talking about when I say the Democrats. Dialogue, respect, and commitment. Every time I seem to hear some of the uh, Nancy Pelosi types, it's always, we want to have a conversation. Mind, mind you, it's a monologue. Uh, there's, there's no talking against their points. It's not a two, dyadic communication is sending and receiving of messages. Uh, but there's, there's always, we're going to send, you're going to receive, and you're not going to talk back. That's a left-wing version of conversation. They, they want a monologue. Huh. Dialogue, respect, and commitment. There's a dialogue going on in France. And Macron is only now listening, but he's not listening. Because if he was listening to the people, he, he would be doing the right things and addressing their concerns. Everything he's doing now is a reaction. That's what happens when you hold on to a rigid ideology that is removed from the people. That's what's happening in France. That's what Macron is doing. Um, so now, he made all these promises. Promise for this, we're going to increase this. Uh, you know, in that segment, there was, if you read the captioning, uh, there was one section about how we're going to increase the minimum wage by 100 euros a month and the employers aren't going to have to pay for it. Anybody who knows Economics 101 knows that the employers pay for it one way or the other. And in, in a country where taxes are already too high, what do you think is going to pay for that 100 euro a month increase in the minimum wage? The taxes are going to go up further. Is, is that going to be productive for the French people? Probably not. So the question is, who is going to foot the bill for all of Macron's measures, his excess government spending? Let's take a look. Even as the president was speaking, the number crunching was well underway. The junior budget minister estimated the total cost of the package at between 8 and 10 billion euros. 
Although the French finance ministry has yet to produce official figures, it is estimated that scrapping the tax on overtime will cost the state three and a half billion euros. Reversing a hike in social security payments on pensions, one and a half billion euros. And another 200 to 500 million euros in lost revenues on the end of year bonuses that President Macron is asking companies who can to pay. The cost of the minimum wage increase is unclear but it will be borne by the state and not employers. Estimates go up to 2 billion euros and this will come from tax cuts and bringing forward an increase in income support payments. Even before these measures were announced, next year's budget already predicted a deficit of 2.8% GDP. Experts say these measures could tip France's deficit over the permitted 3%. Macron is looking for solutions. I need our big companies and our wealthiest citizens to help the nation to succeed. I will meet with them to talk about this as of this week. And big companies must pay taxes. It is simply fair. Companies are already reacting to his plea. French advertising giant Publicis, whose headquarters were damaged by the Yellow Vest demonstrations on the Champs-Élysées, say they will pay an end-of-year bonus to staff earning less than €2,500 a month if the law exonerating it from taxes is passed in time. No comfy night in front of the TV. Oh, in other words, taxes are still going to go up despite them talking about a tax cut. That doesn't make sense because now it would make sense in a um, in a classical economical kind of way to be able to reduce taxes in order to spur economic growth, which would then grow the revenues to the government, and then you could use that to pay for. I can understand in that regard. Uh, that's actually why we pushed for tax cuts a year ago in the United States. That's why the corporate rate went down to its lowest level in who knows how long. What is the corporate rate now, like 21% down from 38? And 100 years ago it was at like 90%. The corporate, when you cut taxes, it spurs economic growth. And that's what we've seen in this last year in the United States. We've had a huge boom in the economy uh, because of those tax cuts. But now, on one hand, you have economic growth, but on the other hand, if you have an increase in government spending, are you really that much ahead? And that's a question we have in our own country. We cut the taxes, but we haven't cut the spending, so if the spending continues to go up at the rate of increase of the collection of, re of increased revenues, are we really that much further off? I'm not sure we are. The one thing I'll tell you in the United States, we do have to get a good curtail on spending. You know, our federal government is way too bloated, we take on way too much debt, and that is something that the Trump administration and Congress, both parties, have to take the time to address. Right now they're not addressing it. Uh, they're not addressing it in France, although they're actually trying to look at the supply side on cutting taxes. That's not a bad thing, but Macron is blowing any opportunity he has by, um, you know, on tax cuts, by making all these extra government promises that are going to cost more out of the Treasury. Uh, now, there are some of the yellow vests who say it's a little too little, too late. Let's take a look. No comfy night in front of the TV for these yellow vests. Instead, they gathered around a screen set up especially to watch President Emmanuel Macron's speech. But for many, it was too little, too late. It's a start, but it's absolutely not enough. So he increases minimum wage by 100 euros. But couldn't he have done this earlier? It might have satisfied some people, not all the yellow vests, but some. The yellow vest protest broke out across France last month over the price of petrol and the rising cost of living. The movement disrupted businesses and transport across the country. The cost to the economy is said to be 1 billion euros so far. Despite the cold and the run-up to Christmas when most people would be out shopping for presents, the Yellow Vest movement is still going strong. Protesters in Galion, northwest of Paris, have been stopping traffic at a strategic roundabout for the past 26 days. Many aren't convinced by President Macron's attempts to placate them. 
they don't plan to stop. What I fear is that some yellow vests will say, oh great, we've got a 100 euro increase in minimum wage, that's cool, I'll stop now. I'm worried that some yellow vests will be satisfied by these little crumbs. President Macron, sometimes called the president of the rich, has been humbled by a leaderless grassroots movement. And it looks like they're not done with him yet. So where do the French people go from here? What do the protesters want? Uh, that's the next question, and that's our next segment. A long way from the Champs-Élysées, these Gilets Jaunes protesters remain mobilized. They've taken over this motorway toll booth and are offering drivers free passage. Jacques is a teacher at a technical college and one of the group's organizers. The gilet jaune that you see in the streets, they're mainly middle class. And they're being bled dry financially. The wealth gap is getting wider. And we've reached a point where there are the very rich and the very poor. And more and more people are slipping into poverty. It's not about whether we're happy with this. It's about finding a solution. That's the most important thing. Retired Gérard is in charge of collecting the tickets. He's stayed well away from the demos in Paris. We count up how much they're worth and photograph it. One day, perhaps, we'll send the bill to Macron. Chloe and Sabrina have braved the rain and tear gas in the capital. We don't need crumbs. We want the whole baguette. We need to eat. Merci, monsieur. They're not the only ones struggling. Now we're going into a terrible time of year because we can't afford Christmas presents for our kids. I'm 51 and it's like we're going back to the time when my dad gave us an orange and some cheese for Christmas. That's what we're back to. It's terrible. The police haven't intervened, but as they leave at the end of their shift, they tell the protesters it's time to do the same. The Gilets Jaunes walk off happy with their haul of tickets. This is the so-called Peanuts roundabout near Montargis, 120 kilometers south of Paris. It's been in the hands of the Gilets Jaunes since November the 17th, when protests against the planned fuel price hike began. It's on the N7 highway, which is known as the Holiday Road. People back in the day used to take it on a Friday night to go and spend the weekend in Marseille. We can't do that anymore because it costs 350 euros, so it's impossible when you barely earn three times that much. This shelter is base camp. Thomas and Virginie are in charge of logistics. Both work but say they're no longer able to make ends meet. They say they found a sense of community here. We wondered how many people would come here on the first day. Would there be any solidarity? Real solidarity between all the races, all the religions, the united France we've always wanted to see. And on the 17th of November, there were 1,700 of us. So we understood that, yes, solidarity still exists. People here say their purchasing power has nosedived and there's resentment over the president's abolition of a tax on the wealthy. In an area where people depend on their vehicles, the planned fuel tax rise was a step too far. 
That was the final straw. We were already drowning in taxes, and with that, we just wouldn't be able to cope anymore. Then the government agreed to freeze the tax, but that was just an attempt to shut us up. So there you have it. That's what they're dealing with in France, and that looks uh, pretty complicated with... Uh, so it looks like uh, we cut back too soon, so what we're going to do is show you the rest of that video. Roma and Virginie live 15 kilometers from Montargis, both work irregular hours, and they say it's a constant struggle to make ends meet. We just use one and two light bulbs. If it's cold, we try just to use that heater and leave the doors open for the bedrooms. We try to save on everything. This morning, before heading to the roundabout, they check their accounts. Of course we should pay tax. But it's too much, it's over the top. They get rid of the tax on the rich and then make us pay. Something's not right. Why did they get rid of the tax on the wealthy? We're really struggling. The people on 1,000, 1,200 euros. Once we've paid the bills, there's nothing left. Thomas and Virginie have decided to protest in Paris. They say violence has become a necessary evil. If it had just been us Gilets Jaunes at the protests, we'd have been tear gassed and gone in 20 minutes and everybody would have forgotten about us. It's hard to say this, really difficult to say, but the fact that there were vandals meant that we were noticed. It's really bad that it's come to that, but the reality is that it's because of them that people are talking about us. Montargis is a typical medium-sized French town. Unemployment here stands at 12%. In the run into Christmas, trade is slow. The mayor is concerned, with business owners complaining about the impact of the Gilets Jaunes blockades. It's affected all of my shops, and profits are down 20 to 25% and 50% in the one closest to the roundabout. I understand they're suffering, but they're punishing the wrong people. I don't know who they should go after, but it shouldn't be us. We work, we employ people and create wealth. We're the ones who make the system work and we're being strangled. I've asked the interior minister to clear the roundabouts so that people aren't scared anymore. There's a psychological impact when you see the ties and pallets burning. Tense and the gilets jaunes, people wonder what's going to happen. The protests have knocked 30% off trade in the town centre. Back at the camp, we meet Clément. He left his home in the Alps to help here and has become the group's PR man. This is wrapping paper. We make the vests and write messages on them. We're not giving up. In English, Portuguese, German, Italian, Turkish. This goes beyond Montargi. I came here for human contact. So many social links have been lost since small local bars, bakers and shops have shut down. They've all been replaced by big chains. Here you can come and end up being friends with someone you only met two hours ago. Here somebody wrote the Sixth Republic on one of these vests. They were right, that's what needs to happen, something new. Something's going to change, but we don't know what it is. Come on, eat if you're hungry. No, 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 no. Maybe there's not enough for everyone. We should think of those who are struggling. 
Is solidarity important? Yes, yes, very important. You won't tell your boss. They support us. Did they sign the petition? They're kind. There were three of them in the car and they signed. That warms my heart. As night falls, a new team takes over. Gerard says he'll spend Christmas here if he has to. Christmas? If they keep up the pressure, we'll still be here. Because unfortunately, there are those that won't be able to celebrate. I think they'll still be here. It wouldn't be the same otherwise. Despite demands which critics say are unclear and often contradictory, the Gilets jaunes are starting to imagine themselves as a political force. I didn't do higher education. The politicians, you see them on TV. I don't understand half of what they say. Maybe I'm stupid, but I just don't get them. I don't know whether they just do it to confuse us. So I'd like to see a Gilets jaunes party that uses simple language that people understand. Whatever becomes of the Gilets jaunes, they've taken a nation by surprise and rocked its government. Now I'm going to quickly take a look at some of the taxes that are assessed on the French. And really, it's not that much different than the United States in, in certain areas. Uh, just looking at the tax rates for income. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to do some rounding here just for sake of discussion. But uh, uh, below 9,700 euros, all of this is in euros, zero uh, percent. Uh, 9,700 to, well, I'll just read it, 26,818 is 14%. Then the next bracket goes up to 71,898, and that's 30%. Then from 71,898 up to 152,260 is 41%, and beyond uh, 152,260 is 45%. That's pretty much kind of what we have here in, in the United States. Now, mind you, this is you know, the, the uh, national rate. Where they get killed is um, on the value-added tax. 20% is the current standard value-added tax. Uh, there's two uh, reduced rates. Well, there's really three rates uh, that are reduced. 10% rate for books, hotel stays, local public transportation, and restaurant meals. 5%, 5.5% for most groceries. Plus, there's a specific 2.1% rate that applies only to prescription drugs that are covered by Social Security. So if you look at the VAT tax, and if you got to pay, tw it's like a 20% sales tax. The thing is, it compounds. So if you go and buy a car right off the lot, and we'll just say a smart car since we're talking Europe today. You buy a smart car that sells for, well, $10,000. Well, you got to pay 20% on that. But the dealership is charged 20%. And the parts are, that are going in, those are charged 20%. So really, your VAT tax is 20% to each of the components. So your car may actually only cost, say, 5600 but they're going to end up with another 4300 in taxes. That's the thing about the value added tax is that it goes up to it goes pretty much on everything. Here in the United States, we only have a sales tax really on you know you can't I mean there are certain I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because the tax structure even in the United States is pretty complicated because if you you know if you if I'm buying a supply, I can write that tax off. 
you know, I, I can write that whole purchase price off if I'm buying something that goes in. And there's obviously certain rules and restrictions that apply, allowances and variances. Uh, but in, in Europe, it's a little bit different because, um, you know, it is a proportional tax on the output collected by the companies and ultimately completely supported by the final buyer. And so it's added to the, the added value to the product. It's at each stage of production and marketing. So really, 20% is, that, that's almost disingenuous to say it's 20% if you look at all the hidden taxes. They have a, a large gas tax, uh, 44 cent, uh, 44, um, whatever the euro cents is, uh, 44.44 per liter to 0.61 per liter uh, with some regional for diesel. Uh, our gas tax in the United States, just at the federal level, is 18.4, 18.6 cents per gallon. That doesn't include the state tax. So in the United States, we do pay more. If you know, and again, we you know we can move with our feet and walk with our feet. Um, there's so many other additional levels of taxes in France, and that's what they're protesting. And France has got to wake up to the fact that they're killing the middle class over there and the middle class is now uprising. The Greeks, a few years back, they were uprising. Why? Because the Greek government were give, was giving away all of the handouts at government, jacked the, the prices way up, and what happened? The people rebelled. As a matter of fact, they had the debt crisis, and I seem to remember that uh, Chelsea Clinton's husband had purchased a lot of the Greek debt because it was pennies on the dollar. It was worthless, and he thought that he'd be able to make a lot of money by, you know, trading in Greek currency when the Greek uh, when the Greek note stabilized, and they never did, and he took a huge loss on the matter. Because obviously, you got to figure out basic economics here. There's, you got to look back. I'm, I'm hesitating here because there's so much I know and I only want to say just a very little bit here. Uh, Jack Kemp explained it best this way, the late Jack Kemp, uh, U.S. Congressman, Secretary of Labor, uh, and president, a former president and vice presidential candidate. He, uh, in, a, in a speech and I think in one of his books, if the tax rate is zero, how much money does the government get? Zero. If the tax rate is 100%, how much does the government get? Zero. Because nobody's going to do all of the work for free. So the question then becomes, at what point do you maximize the rate so the people can keep the most and you don't get into the... Uh, declining returns and where does the government get the most and I think he had it figured out around 18 percent 17 or 18 percent seems to be about you know that marginal tax rate uh, but that's another discussion for another day the fact is in France like in America they are just putting the boot on the throats of the people with high taxes and that's what the people are rebelling against and that's gonna happen here within the next few years if we don't start keeping the reforms in mind. That's also one of the reasons why Donald Trump was elected president in 2016. Because, um, you know, he promised to not forget the unforgotten people. Anyhow, this has a uh, close parallel in history and so we're going to go back to the French Revolution and if you look at what happened in the French Revolution you look at what's happening in France today you're going to see some very close parallels <music> What rights do people have, and where do they come from? Who gets to make decisions for others, and on what authority? And how can we organize society to meet people's needs? These questions challenged an entire nation during the upheaval of the French Revolution. By the end of the 18th century, Europe had undergone a profound intellectual and cultural shift known as the Enlightenment. Philosophers and artists promoted reason and human freedom over tradition and religion. The rise of a middle class and printed materials encouraged political awareness. 
and the American Revolution had turned a former English colony into an independent republic. Yet France, one of the largest and richest countries in Europe, was still governed by an ancient regime of three rigid social classes called estates. The monarch, King Louis XVI, based his authority on divine right and granted special privileges to the first and second estates, the Catholic clergy and the nobles. The third estate, middle-class merchants and craftsmen, as well as over 20 million peasants, had far less power and they were the only ones who paid taxes, not just to the king, but to the other estates as well. In bad harvest years, taxation could leave peasants with almost nothing, while the king and nobles lived lavishly on their extracted wealth. But as France sank into debt due to its support of the American Revolution and its long-running war with England, change was needed. King Louis appointed finance minister Jacques Necker who pushed for tax reforms and won public support by openly publishing the government's finances. But the king's advisors strongly opposed these initiatives. Desperate for a solution, the king called a meeting of the Estates General, an assembly of representatives from the three estates, for the first time in 175 years. Although the third estate represented 98% of the French population, its vote was equal to each of the other estates. And unsurprisingly, both of the upper classes favored keeping their privileges. Realizing they couldn't get fair representation, the third estate broke off, declared themselves the National Assembly, and pledged to draft a new constitution, with or without the other estates. King Louis ordered the first and second estates to meet with the National Assembly, but he also dismissed Necker, his popular finance minister. In response, thousands of outraged Parisians joined with sympathetic soldiers to storm the Bastille prison, a symbol of royal power and a large storehouse of weapons. The revolution had begun. As rebellion spread throughout the country, the feudal system was abolished. The Assembly's Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen proclaimed a radical idea for the time, that individual rights and freedoms were fundamental to human nature and government existed only to protect them. Their privileges gone, many nobles fled abroad, begging foreign rulers to invade France and restore order. And while Louis remained as the figurehead of the constitutional monarchy, he feared for his future. In 1791, he tried to flee the country, but was caught. The attempted escape shattered people's faith in the king. The royal family was arrested, and the king charged with treason. After a trial, the once revered king was publicly beheaded, signaling the end of 1,000 years of monarchy and finalizing the September 21st Declaration of the First French Republic, governed by the motto, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité. Nine months later, Queen Marie Antoinette, a foreigner long mocked as Madame Deficit for her extravagant reputation, was executed as well. But the revolution would not end there. Some leaders, not content with just changing the government, sought to completely transform French society. Its religion, its street names, even its calendar. As multiple factions formed, the extremist Jacobins, led by Maximilien Robespierre, launched a reign of terror to suppress the slightest dissent, executing over 20,000 people before the Jacobins' own downfall. Meanwhile, France found itself at war with neighboring monarchs seeking to strangle the revolution before it spread. Amidst the chaos, a general named Napoleon Bonaparte took charge, becoming emperor as he claimed to defend the revolution's democratic values. All in all, the revolution saw three constitutions and five governments within 10 years, followed by decades alternating between monarchy and revolt before the next republic formed in 1871. And while we celebrate the French Revolution's ideals, we still struggle with many of the same basic questions raised over two centuries ago. One looks back at the French Revolution as a blueprint and a pattern for what to do or what not to do. One of the early historians who examined the uh, 
the French Revolution was uh, Alexis de Tocqueville. And he had written The Old Regime and the Revolution, uh, 1856. Now, he was born in 1805. Uh, I think it was 1840 when he, let me look him up here, 18, he had visited America and he had written the book Democracy in America, 1835. And so he was looking at, he was kind of looking at that difference already by at the age of 20, yeah, 30. When he was 30 years old, he was kind of already looking at the ideas of how a democratic society is run versus a feudalistic society. Uh, he had written Democracy in America and had wrote of his travels through the United States covering the market revolution, Western expansion, uh, Jacksonian democracy, the modern Democratic Party uh, comes from uh, Tom, um, uh, Andrew Jackson. And what he was trying to do was help the people of France get a better understanding on their position between a fading aristocratic order that they were having there and an emerging democratic order that was happening here. And he saw democracy as an equation that balanced that liberty and equality and the concern for individual rights as well as for the community. I would highly encourage you to read Democracy in America, but I would also encourage you to read his other book that came out in 1856, The Old Regime and the Revolution, or The Old Regime and the French Revolution. Uh, it is very enlightening if you take a look at the old feudal order versus what they ended up with in France. And one of the things that when I had read The Old Regime and the Revolution uh, that I had, that really struck me was the way the French were organizing society with central planning. It was the government was planning everything. The government was controlling your life. They were going to tax you, and they were going to tell you how you spend it. That's the way things were going on in France uh, during the Revolution. What's happening in America today? The government is taking more of your money, and they're telling you how to spend it. It's also forward home. And it uh, looks like I was just texted a quote from de, to de Tocqueville. And let me pull it up real quick. Uh, it is right here from the, uh, okay, the American Republic will endure until the day Congress discovers that it can bribe the public with people's money. That is so true. Again, from Alexis de Tocqueville, the American Republic will endure until the day Congress discovers that it can bribe the public with the people's uh, bribe the public with the public's money. They're doing it, and they're doing it in France. They're doing it in the United States. They're doing it all over, and I guess that's what we have to watch out for. That's what this entire show today is all about. So, with that in mind, we are going to go to our music, and we are going to go to University of South Dakota playing the French national anthem. Reminding you there's 11 shopping days left until Christmas. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.